Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the NCBI webinar on the evolution of NCBI style hackathons. Uh, Peter Cooper, uh, the head of the communications group, is here with me to answer uh, specific questions, and I will answer more general questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, answers uh, that we don't get to will be available linked to our webinars page and also the materials will be available on our FTP site. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So at this point, we've run about 13 NCBI style hackathons uh, over the course of this webinar. I'm going to tell you about what NCBI hackathons are, uh, what we do in these NCBI style hackathons, and how you can get involved. So what we do in NCBI style hackathons in short is we put together teams of five to six individuals who all work on different bioinformatics projects in a collaborative way. And 80% of those teams finish a functional software prototype at the end of three days. These aren't three 24 hour days. In fact, they're typically three nine hour days. But those nine hours are really filled with very focused work. When we started these hackathons, uh, we were teaching a lot of workshops in next generation sequencing, and we thought hackathons would be a good way to offer very advanced next generation sequencing courses. What we quickly realized is that what we were actually doing was rapidly building software prototypes, and that was the major motivation for people coming to these hackathons. So what we ended up doing was really optimizing the hackathons. Uh, such that the teams develop software prototypes. And like I said earlier, about 80% of teams in the NCBI hackathons develop working software prototypes. So in our first hackathon, uh, we built four functional software products, including things like variant calling for RNA-seq. Uh, that, was, that was pretty neat and really did a survey of available tools uh, for calling variants in RNA-seq. Those tools have really progressed a lot, but it was nice to have a place where you could really uh, see things uh, in one place. In August 2015, we built six functional software products, and a couple of them, including the sort of machine learning-based pharmacogenomics prediction pipeline, are still in active development. In fact, in the hackathons in total, we've developed about 80 software products, and about 40 of them are stable or still in active development. This is a picture, uh, this is a subset of the people that were in that particular hackathon. And this is approximately what an NCBI hackathon looks like. Although, as I'll discuss later, uh, now they're in uh, many, many different locations. All of the tools that we build in NCBI hackathons are totally open source, and we put everything on GitHub. As I'll talk about later, we also containerize things. So uh, we, we also see manifestations on Docker Hub, Jupyter, other places as well. We build several things in NCBI hackathons and things end up in several places. Some things end up being worked into uh, NCBI production. I'd say that's sort of a minority of things. Other things end up being part of uh, our standalone bioinformatics tools, but other things uh, really end up being part of educational experiences. And we work them into webinars, but also into larger scale online genomics courses. And uh, one thing I'm particularly proud of, we built an educational resource for RNA-seq, uh, which is self-guided. And you can go to right now and uh, fire up some cloud instances, either on Google Cloud Engine or Amazon Web Services, and teach yourself how to do RNA-seq mapping with STAR, HiSET, and Magic Blast. Uh, like I said, we worked this into an online workshop. The first five lectures of that online workshop are available on YouTube right now. 2016, we really sort of extended the frequency. These uh, hackathons became very popular, and we started uh, having them in other places, including Old Spring Harbor at ISMB. And also, uh, HackSeq was an NCBI-style hackathon uh, that was run in Vancouver, and I uh, was a participant, not an organizer of that event. And it was a very special and very large NCBI style hackathon. So then in January, we went back to our main product or sort of the regular hackathon rotation. And we really started building things uh, that integrated with larger software pipelines, including 
things like SRA to R, which you can see here in the middle of your screen, uh, which is an R package and will probably end up in Bioconductor uh, as a way to port data from SRA into R frameworks. We also started partnering with other groups. And uh, I mentioned HackSeq before. We were able to also start building novel things, like, for example, ways to compare structural variants to structural variant databases. And that's that's really been a, a neat focus of some of our work is, is working with structural variants, uh, as there are, in my opinion, not enough tools uh, to analyze that kind of data uh, in the bioinformatics community. Like I said, we started working with Bioconda, uh, a little bit with Linux Brew, as well as Bioconductor. A lot of the things uh, in our hackathons uh, deal well with the uh, sequence read archive, like the SRA to R package I mentioned earlier. We're also interested in fostering community involvement uh, with these hackathons, and I'll talk about that even more at the end. Uh, but we were able to build a platform for metadata categorization by NLM indexers. So they were able to uh, go ahead and annotate metadata in GEO, which has been a bioinformatics community hobby for the last 15 or 20 years. And we were, they actually annotated uh, all of the metadata for 14,000 Drosophila RNA-seq data sets, which uh, we then used in a collaboration with Flybase. We've also been able to uh, harmonize some of the metadata in, in dbGaP uh, with the NIH Common Data Element Repository. Another thing that I'm, I'm particularly excited about is the ability to do really experimental things. So to our knowledge, uh, until this point, it was very, very difficult for people to put full genomes into a graph, and, and few people had uh, attempted it. And so uh, in a hackathon we ran in Cold Spring Harbor, we were able to load seven full human genomes into a VG-based graph structure. Um, and that was something that I think was quite neat and a project that's ongoing. We've also been able to work quite a bit on immunogenic peptides, uh, looking at classifying different types of immunogenic peptides from cancer, bacteria, as well as viruses. And uh, this is something that I think is of particular clinical relevance. It's called Danger Track. This is effectively is a public blacklist for regions of the human genome that are relatively unstable and hence really unsuitable for algorithmic short variant calling. So basically this tells you where as a clinician, you might want to do double check before you report uh, particular variants to a patient. So I have a question from the audience uh, asking if uh, these hackathons are focused solely on genomics. So it's a very good question. The hackathons are mostly genomics based, but we have done some non-genomics projects, particularly in uh, external hackathons. Uh, we, In fact, we had one product project uh, that was working with EEG technology. That said, the majority of them are based around genomics, but with the big caveat that in January, each January, uh, we have a sort of biomedical informatics hackathon at the National Library of Medicine. And that really gets into a lot of things, you know, involving text mining and so on. So thank you for that question. So in 2017, we've really sort of evolved to emphasize containerization publication and accessibility of uh, these hackathon products. And and I'm really uh, sort of proud of this because I, I think one of the things that the hackathons really contribute to the community is speeding up science. And I told you before that at this point, about 80% of the hackathon products become functional prototypes. But another thing I'm particularly proud of is about 10% of them get published as manuscripts, often within a couple of months of uh, finishing the project in the hackathon. And that's that to me is is really quite neat. I think uh, accelerating scientific publication, in my personal opinion, is, is very important. One of the things that's very accessible that we built in a hackathon is uh, FENVAR. And you can see the URL here. It's uh, fenvar.colorado.edu. This will generate uh, word clouds of concepts co-mentioned uh, with SNPs in PubMed abstracts. Uh, but my friends like to remind me that word clouds really aren't uh, serious science. But what is serious science is this will also uh, generate D3 rendered networks of uh, SNPs and particular PMIDs. So that may be useful to some of the folks in the audience. And uh, to the uh, question before, this is an example of some of the sort of biomedical text mining stuff we do and in integrating it with genomics. 
something that's sort of pure text mining, uh, we built something called PubRunner. I'm very excited about PubRunner. Basically what it is is a framework uh, for natural language processing tools that continuously updates the PubMed corpus. And this, this framework could also be used to update other corpora for natural language processing research. And uh, we're working on packaging this and collaborating with a lot of groups to, uh, to allow them to auto-update their PubMed corpus. If you're interested in this, please send me an email. It's ben, B-E-N, dot, B-U-S-B-Y at NIH.gov. The head developer of this in the hackathon, Jake Lever, uh, is currently working in my group uh, for the next four weeks on this project. So this would be a particularly good time uh, to contact me. Uh, we've also been able to take uh, other people's software products um, and really put them in more reproducible frameworks. So we have a common workflow language pipeline for epigenomics called Screw. Uh, and if you do epigenomics, I'd, I'd really encourage you to check that out because I, I think that uh, reproducibility is really important, but particularly in the epigenomic space. Uh, and we've been able to, to collaborate in this particular case with GA4GH. So this is actually a slide uh, generated by uh, the Global Alliance Data Working Group, and uh, it shows NCBI as a, a repository that will work with their API. But uh, at the time they made this slide, NCBI's data repositories actually didn't work uh, with their Reads API. Uh, but in a hackathon, we were able to stitch these two things together. And it really worked quite beautifully. And, and right now, we're working actually to extend this uh, to be able to work with raw data on the fly. So basically, the idea is that the Reads API uh, can even work on unaligned data. So uh, that's something I'm particularly excited about. Uh, as we go to more and more sort of decentralized databases for this type of genomic data. In, in other things, we've also done things like looking at uh, resources for, for RNA-seq, uh, both viewing and uh, doing counts, as well as identification of novel viruses. That's something I'm particularly excited about. But also when we announce teams uh, that, that want to work on virus identification and integration, uh, they're extremely popular at the hackathons. So I think that's uh, it's a topic that really grabs uh, the imagination and enthusiasm of uh, folks that attend our hackathons. Speaking of, I, I'd like to take a brief segue and talk about the kind of people that come to our hackathons. So typically they're computational biologists who are either sort of senior graduate students or postdocs. And people that lead the teams at the hackathons are typically sort of senior postdocs or people at the assistant professor level. That said, there are exceptions to every rule and we've had fairly young people both attend and even lead teams at the hackathons. So uh, if you're interested, please contact uh, me directly or simply sign up for a hackathon. Um, we've also been able to foster community involvement uh, with the hackathons project in a couple of other ways. We're starting to build educational resources that really help people leverage uh, community tools. And I'm gonna talk about uh, an expansion of uh, this a little bit later. So this is the eDirect cookbook, uh, which will probably be mentioned in next week's NCBI webinars on APIs. Uh, but I'll show you that these are Jupyter notebooks that we're building uh, to enhance NCBI education. And we really hope to build a whole suite of uh, computational resources uh, that are used to leverage NCBI databases. And, and we think that's going to be really helpful to the community. And if you're interested in getting involved in those projects, whether it's through hackathons or through some other means, please feel free to contact myself or Peter Cooper. Next, I wanna show you some really cutting edge stuff that we built just a couple of weeks ago. And this, these are the projects that I'm very excited about. And I'm, I'm really proud to say that they're uh, still fairly stable and in ongoing development. One of the things we built is a very simple, easy to use tool for looking at antimicrobial resistance genes in metagenomics data sets. And this really heavily leverages uh, Magic Blast, which is a new flavor of Blast optimized to deal with next generation sequencing reads that we built at NCBI. It also used the CARD database to identify some of these metagenomic resistance genes. Although uh, I think it's, uh, it's very attractive to integrate databases as well as putting in some learning modules. So uh, I 
really encourage you to go to GitHub, grab this code, check it out. It's Dockerized. It's very easy to leverage and use uh, on anybody's Linux system. And uh, right now, the Cancer Genomics Cloud is free, and you can also leverage it there. Uh, so that may be something to check out. Uh, we're also really interested in streaming data and, and what this particular thing does. Uh, so we we built a database of adapters that are present in the SRA. And the really neat thing about that is if you know what the adapters are in SRA for your particular data set, then you can trim the adapters on the fly. So if you want to if you want to do some assembly and generate context, now you actually don't have to do fast queue dump anymore. You can simply trim your adapters on the fly and then go ahead and build context from streaming data, which is something that I think is very attractive. The NCBI infrastructure, but with just also with genomic data getting larger. And if you have any general questions on that, I'd love to answer them on FTP or once again, you can email me directly. I was particularly proud of a team. Uh, they came uh, from a particular academic institution and they really wanted to build a viewer for an excellent mouse aging data set. And what they actually ended up doing was building really modular uh, types of viewers uh, for existing RNA-seq viewers. And I think that's really important because there are currently 35 RNA-seq viewers that are up in the community and supported about 35. And I think it's really important to say, well, if you have a particular uh, thing that you want to be able to view, it's it's great to build modular tools that you can insert into those viewers. And that's something we've become uh, really, really interested in. And at the end of the hackathon, uh, we were able to generate movies uh, looking at mouse aging with and without infection uh, to flu. And what's really amazing to me is even at this extremely uh, zoomed out level of the mouse genome, uh, you're able to see responses uh, to influenza uh, over long periods of time. There is a question about virtual hackathons, but I will wait till the end um, to get into that. And this was a really uh, experimental project. And, and I think I look forward to iterating on this project. I'm, I'm really, to be frank, uh, this team was filled with brilliant people, but I'm not sure that random flipping uh, is the most prudent obfuscation model. But, but basically what this does is it sends a robot into anybody's data sets, looks for particular variants, and then if uh, it's desired by the people that own the data, it obfuscates the data so it's no longer personally identifiable. The nice thing is that switch can be flipped back off uh, to generate a full data matrix if some collaboration agreement is reached, based and which is obviously uh, consistent with the con patient consents on the data. Uh, we've also been ha helping out with other people's hackathons. That's something I'm particularly proud of. Uh, we've helped out with some things at BioIT as well as recently an artificial intelligence genomics hackathon in San Francisco. Um, and these are things we look forward, really look forward to, to working with. Also on the uh, NCBI hackathons GitHub site, which I'll put up in the last slide, you can find a repo for uh, being able to run your own NCBI style hackathons, uh, which I'd be happy to help out with uh, as well. But if, if you just want to roll your own, please, please feel free to take any pieces of this and, and do that. I, I think uh, we'd like to see more of this. And there's there's certainly no shortage of folks that, that are interested in. Also, uh, our next hackathon is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania uh, at the end of September. And one of the things we're likely going to be working on is an out of the box uh, sort of automatic hackathon builder. And that's that's something I'm pretty excited about. So uh, I mentioned that there are publications out of the hackathons. And one of the places uh, we publish these uh, hackathon results, as well as allow other people to publish these hackathon results, is in F1000 Research. And, and they've been really uh, sort of wonderful in, in working with us on uh, publishing hackathon tools. But certainly, some communication of these tools has gone to other journals as well. Um, you can also follow uh, at DC Genomics on Twitter. So, and, and other places on Twitter, we try to advertise uh, things in these hackathons. This is a picture of some of the folks uh, in the New York Genome, the most recent New York Genome Center hackathon in uh, June. And uh, that was really a fantastic experience with a lot of folks from both that metro area as well as folks that came in from across the country and, and even other countries. 
Uh, so, like I said, here's a list of some of the un upcoming hackathons. If any of you are in California, there will almost certainly be a Northern California hackathon the first week in April, uh, likely either at UCSC or UCSF. And uh, we're trying to work on a Southern California hackathon that may occur in January. So uh, please check this site for that. Finally, uh, the actual repos can be found uh, both at this... Uh, this uh, GitHub organization, and then uh, sort of stable and uh, other re other projects that are continuing to be developed can be found at uh, this URL, ncbihackathons.github.io. So thank you very much for your time. There'll be a blog post coming out on NCBI Insights uh, about some of the products from the last three hackathons, uh, Boulder, Colorado, New York Genome Center, as well as the one we just ran at NCBI. Uh, and now I'm going to take questions, and I, I actually have one queued up here. And, and it's an excellent question. So the question is, are there plans to host virtual hackathons? So we've done quite a few experiments uh, with virtual hackathons. And one thing we've seen is that we, when we involve virtual people, we actually see not even uh, sort of less production, but dramatically less production from the people that are uh, involved online. At least that's been our experience so far. However, the last experiment we did on that, we had a hackathon veteran, somebody who had been to several hackathons working part-time to sort of work on modular tools. And that was a very positive experience. We've also had uh, people do quite a bit of work online after the hackathons. So, so what I could see uh, a model of is sort of hackathon veterans or people coming to in-person hackathons uh, of this style and then uh, continuing to work independently. That said, uh, of course, there are other hackathon models that work very well online. Sort of long-term competitive hackathons tend to work very well online. And one of the things we've talked about doing is in the virus discovery space, as well as the antimicrobial resistance space, is hosting sort of long-term online hackathons uh, to really leverage some of the tools we've built in the in-person hackathons and, and use them to analyze data sets. I would also like to mention that there will be a second year of HackSeq. So that's the big, awesome genomics hackathon in Vancouver I mentioned. Um, and you can actually go there and register at hackseek.com. So a neat thing is uh, that there are now other hackathons uh, running on this model. Someone else asked, does the hackathon have a Slack channel or team? And in fact, this is a great question. So each hackathon uh, has its own Slack organization, uh, which obviously persists after the hackathons. We, we originally ran them through Google Groups and then we moved to Slack. Uh, and that's been very popular. We also have a LinkedIn group for hackathon alumni where jobs are posted, people can talk about issues, that sort of thing. And we also make announcements. Um, and that's something I'm really proud of because what I think we're doing uh, with the NCBI hackathons and other NCBI style hackathons like HackSeq is we're creating a community of really both excellent computational biologists, but I think we're also seeing evidence suggest, that suggests that uh, these people work well with other people and, and really, in my experience, are, are really kind and nice people. And so I think this actually also makes an excellent tool for building a phenomenal computational biology workforce. That uh, alumni group may actually expand from uh, being uh, mostly a LinkedIn presence to Slack and other avenues of social media. I'd also like to mention that uh, in the third week of June, 2018, we're having a, a hackathon in Boulder, Colorado as part of a genomics conference. And we'd really like that to be mostly what we're calling a champions hackathon. So mostly hackathon alumni that come to Boulder and really work to integrate some of the projects and build sort of larger scale bioinformatics platforms. So like I said, bringing those people back and, and having them continue uh, to work for the bioinformatics community. 
Finally, we're starting to integrate with other bioinformatics hackathons uh, that you may be familiar with. So I've been to the BOSS hackathons and we're talking with them uh, about uh, integrating as well as sort of the, uh, the general bio hackathons community and Elixir. Those are uh, things I look forward to telling you about sometime soon. Great. Well, uh, thank you for the really great questions, people that ask questions. I think with that, and actually, uh, typically, many times I don't uh, put the Q&A session on the recording, but I think perhaps for this one uh, will be popular. So thanks to everybody who attended and uh, all you hackathon alumni out there. There's a couple in attendance here. And uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and sign off. If you have any further questions, please feel free to email me. And we just have, we have one or two spots uh, available for the Pittsburgh Hackathon. Um, the deadline is closed, but if you're very, very interested and you're able to go to Pittsburgh September 25th, 26th, and 27th, uh, please go ahead and sign up. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a fantastic rest of the day. Have a fantastic week, and tune in next week uh, for an NCBI webinar on NCBI APIs. I think you'll find that there's a lot more NCBI APIs than you thought there were.